Let me invite you to turn to God's word in the first letter of John. We thank the Lord that uh, as we've been journeying through the book of, or rather through the letter of First John, that he has been faithful and he has allowed us to today come to the end of uh, this letter. And uh, for me, it's an accomplishment to have begun a book and to finish it. Uh, it's something I thank God for. So let's turn there first. John chapter 5. We will be considering verses 20 and 21, but let's just read from verse 1. And I read, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his command. For this is the love of God, that we keep his command. And his commandments are not burdensome, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is who, he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the, has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And this is a testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that you have toward him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin, there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but, we who are, but he who has been born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you that you have fed us in the past. We thank you that as we journeyed through the, this letter of First John, you have been faithful to allow us to gain much from your word. 
And oh Lord, our plea, our cry is that even as we come to the end of this letter, as we are encouraged, as we are warned, as we are reminded of the truths of Christ, our prayer, our cry is that, oh Lord, you would feed us again. If that by your spirit, oh Heavenly Father, you would cause us to gain much this day. Oh Lord, we ask you that you would help us, that we would be refreshed to see the greatness of Christ. We would be drawn to him to see his goodness. Oh, Heavenly Father, we pray that we may worship you even as we hear your word. We pray that our hearts would be warmed towards you, oh, Heavenly Father. And we pray, oh, Holy Spirit, that you would help us, that your word would be implanted in our hearts, that it would produce fruit and fruit that glorifies the Father. So help us, Lord, to grasp and understand the truths of your word. Teach us. Help me, O Lord, that in my weakness, that, O Lord, you would help me nonetheless to bring out your word faithfully to your people. Help me, O Lord, that I would be faithful, that I would be clear, that I would be simple as I bring out the truth of your word so that your people would be blessed on this day. Have mercy on us, Lord. Save the lost. Strengthen the weak. Warn the careless. And we pray that we would all be lifted up to you as we hear your word this morning. So we thank you and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Just uh, recently, I remember I was talking to someone and uh, we were talking about how different cultures have a different understanding of what is precious to them. For example, if you, let me begin with Kenya. One of the things with us Kenyans is one of the things that is precious to a Kenyan is his title deed and his shamba, isn't it? It's what we Kenyans like talking about. It is what Kenyans would say it's the most precious thing to them. And let me prove that this is so precious. Look at even the clashes that we have had in this country. Why have we fought one another? It's because of land, isn't it? As a culture, there is a way in which land has been a thing that is so precious to us as a culture, such that our, whenever we think of investments, the first thing that comes to our mind is, I need to buy that piece of land. And we, I remember talking to this brother, and we were engaging, and we were thinking about, now, if you go to another culture, if you go to India, for example, you will find that for the Indians, they would not be so much into buying land. Land is not a big thing like in Kenya. For them, it's gold. They would buy a lot of gold jewelry and, uh, and, and they would buy gold and store it somewhere. And they do that so that they may be able to transfer. It's easy to transfer that wealth from one country to another. You know, unlike Kenyans, that it's very hard to transfer your land, isn't it? You can't move it to, from Kenya to the U.S., but for Indians, they can move it from India, just melt it into rings and jewelry, and then take it to another country. And for them, that is what is precious to them. And if you go to another country, you will find they will give you an idea of what is precious to them, and they will give you an explanation as to why this thing is very precious to them. Now the question comes, to you who believe in Christ. What is precious to you? Let's be honest. What's precious to you? 
Is this those things that I've just mentioned? Would we say that Christ is the most precious thing to us, but in reality, there is something that we deeply, and you know, something that we can't even tell the person seated next to you, you know that is your treasure. Or would you indeed say that Christ is the most valuable and the most precious thing to me? And if someone asks you for a reason why, you would be able to give a reason why Christ is precious to you. Just like that Kenyan will give you a reason why land is precious to them. Or why that Indian will give you a reason why gold is precious to them. Or why this person will tell you it's stock exchange or it's this and that. Why is Christ precious to you? Why is it the one thing that you would say, take every other thing from me, but give me Christ? You would say like the hymnist, give me Christ or else I, I die. Well, I would like to give you some reason if you don't already have them. Or I would like to reinforce those reasons why Christ is precious to us this afternoon. So that when you leave those doors. And someone asks you, why would you die for this Jesus? Why would you leave father and mother and children and wife and lands for Christ? You would say, why? When your friends ask you, why have you stopped living the life you used to live? You would tell them, why? You would be able to have the confidence to tell them, listen, this is why. This man, Jesus Christ, is so precious and important to me. Well, first of all, I want us to see that the reason why Christ is precious to us is that he is the true and eternal God. This is what John says in the last part of chapter 20. He, that is Christ, he is the true God and eternal life. Why is Christ precious to you and I? Because he is God. Because he is the eternal one. Can you imagine of all the things in this world that we pride ourselves with? Of all the things that we put our hope in? Of all the things that we consider precious? Do you know the truth is, we will one day lose all of them? All of them. Why? Those things are not eternal. Consider all that you think about being that, that is precious to you. It could be your family, and amen, we thank God for our families. But we all know one day we will lose them, isn't it? Or they will lose us. As sad as that may be, is the reality. We don't like thinking about it, but it will happen. Should Christ study. Think about your job, that thing that is precious to you. It's not eternal. You will lose it or it will lose you, isn't it? There will come a day when this church will tell me, thank you, Pastor Dominic, for your service all those years, but we now think you are old. You need to take some time out, isn't it? It will happen. But there is one thing that is eternal. God. Christ. That's why he is precious. And John, as we see in this letter, we see that John ends his letter with the highest note 
possible. He ends, as we would say, with a bang, pointing to Christ. He began by teaching on Christ. You remember in chapter 1 and verse 1? He began by teaching on Christ who came in the flesh and whom he and the other apostles testify as being what? 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, that which we have, which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes and which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. He began with Christ, and he now ends with Christ. In the start of his letter in chapter 1 and verse 1, John asserts the humanity of Christ. That's why he says we saw him, we touched him, we heard him. He wasn't a phantom. He was real. We saw him, we touched him. And now, he, in the close of his letter, John now shows or asserts and reaffirms that that man, that man whom they saw, that man whom they had, that man who they touched, because they touched and they saw the nails where they went through, where they pierced him, and they saw where the the spear had gone through his side, that man whom they saw. That from Nazareth is the very God of the very God. Jesus Christ is the true God by whom creation and salvation are dependent. And this is why, again, Christ is so precious to us. In Christ, we have God. I would say, in Christ, God is ours, the one who created everything. It's only believers who can brag about that, that I have God. No one else can brag about that. Someone can brag, I have education. I have wealth. I have family, I have this and that. But it's only the believer who can say, I have the eternal God. The wealth of wealth. Can you imagine the one who created everything? He is ours. This is the aspect, or this is one of the aspects that differentiates Christianity or Christ from all other religions. In all other religions, what you simply have is ethics, or you have a way of life, or you have a way of dealing with life. But in Christianity, you have God. You don't just possess some ethics. You possess God himself. You don't just have some truths. You have the truth. This is why Christ is so precious to us, dear brethren. This is why Christ is the most important person, not just in this room, but in all creation. There will never be anyone like him. Never be anyone like him. Of all the armies that have marched on this world, of all the armies that have conquered, of all the generals that have won battles, of all the presidents that have been great, that have brought development, no one can match Christ. Why? He is a true and eternal God. He alone is God. Christ alone claimed to be God and showed his glory as God in his earthly ministry. He alone commanded nature, isn't it? 
We saw that Christ is the only one who told the winds to cease. And you know, when you read that, when you read that account in the gospel, the Bible doesn't say he, he, he commanded the winds to stop and they ceased slowly. We are told that immediately the you know, the, the waters even didn't take time to slow down. Immediately, they were calm. That goes against physics, isn't it? Because we know in physics, when the waters are troubled, it takes time for them to do what? To calm down. But with Christ, what are we told? He simply said, Be still, and immediately. He beat the laws of physics. That's why everyone was shocked. Like, what just happened? How can waters that were troubled and, 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 and waves that were aggressive, how can they just calm down, disappear, like nothing ever happened? He is God. The God of the very God. This is why Christ is so precious to us. This is why I want you to remember that Christ is so precious. If you have anything that you think is of value more than Christ, as I end this letter of First John, I want to hammer this truth, this point. There is nothing more precious to us like Christ. There will never be anyone more precious than Christ. Why? He is God. We see that he healed the sick. Those who are sick, various sicknesses. Those who are blind, those who are deaf. Even those who are demon-possessed. I mean, people who are shocked. How is it that he is able to cast out evil spirit? How come he is just able to heal the blind? To open the eyes of the blind? To open the ears of the deaf? He is God. What the Gospels are telling us, whenever you read the Gospels, what the Gospels from, uh, from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are telling us, Behold your God. You remember that hymn we sang in the beginning? Behold our God. That's what they are telling us. Behold your God. It is only Christ who raised the dead. He raised those who are dead. No one did that. Well, Elijah, play, uh, is it Elijah who prayed for that young man who was dead? But not in the way that Christ did it. Christ simply commanded Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. Again, uh, I remember someone was reminding us the other day that if Christ hadn't specified Lazarus come forth, everyone who was dead in the world would have risen from the grave. He had to specify Lazarus come forth. That's the kind of power that he had. Why? He is a true and eternal God. And we possess him. He is ours. He is the precious thing we have. I don't know whether that's something you think about. I don't know whether that's something that excites you. I don't know whether that's something that gives you hope. I pray it does. All that we have the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the creator of heaven and earth, as ours. Indeed, what does it matter? What does it matter whether we eat, whether we are healthy, whether things are working for us or not? If we have Christ, nothing else matters. And that's why believers of old, 
would be killed, would be tortured, would see their families being killed in front of their own eyes. They would be burnt alive. They would be fed to lions. You know why they had the courage and the peace and the hope to endure that? And they were not afraid because they had this. I have Christ. What does it matter whether they take the things I have? Let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also. The body they may kill. You know that hymn, isn't it? What wonderful words. We have Christ. It is only him who is the eternal one. And therefore, it is only him who can give eternal life. It is only Christ who can give eternal hope. It is only Christ who can give eternal joy. Those things only come from him who is eternal. Because, let me tell you, the truth is, something that is mortal will only give you that which is mortal, isn't it? If there is any hope that I can give you as Dominic, the only hope I can give you is mortal hope. Because I am a human being, I can tell you, tomorrow I'll give you 300 shillings. But then I don't see tomorrow. Something happens to me. Your hope is gone, isn't it? I'm not eternal. But Christ is the only one who is eternal. And therefore, all that he gives is eternal. The hope he gives is eternal. The joy he gives is eternal. The life he gives is eternal. But this same Christ, for those who do not believe in Christ, for those who are hardened in their sins this morning, for those who continue in their sin, he, this Christ is the only one who can give eternal judgment, who can cast into eternal fire, who can bring eternal separation from God. To the unbeliever, as you listen to this and you're wondering, well, true, he can give this and that and the other. But why should that bother me? It should bother you because this eternal God, this Christ, we are told he's able to cast you into the eternal flames of hell. Why? Because we are born in sin. And the only way that we can be saved is to believe in him. To put our hope in his finished work on the cross. To look to him as Savior and as God and to plead to him for salvation. Please do so. Don't let this service end while you're still in your sin. Repent and put your hope in this eternal Christ. But then secondly, the other reason why Christ is precious to us. Yes, he is the eternal, the true and eternal God. But then we are told something about Christ. That he is our loving and caring shepherd. As John ends, this letter, he puts that, those two words together. Little children. Now this is a style that John normally uses to refer to believers throughout his letter. If you look at the letter of 1 John, this is a way that he refers to believers. Little children. Little children. And even in a one place, he calls them my children in chapter 2 and verse 1.
Now that phrase is normally used to show that, first of all, John, as the apostle, loves the saints. He's saying, I love you, dear saints. I love you who belong to Christ. But primarily what John is saying whenever he uses this word little children is that you're not only loved by me, the apostle, you are loved by God himself. When we look at this word, what we should see, uh, especially in the Greek word tek tekna or teknon, what that means is darlings, or to indicate loved ones. Is that same word as darlings, or little children, children belonging to someone. And what John is saying, just as children are dear and loved, and precious in the eyes of their father. So believers are dear and greatly loved by Christ. John writes to them in this way so that they may remember that in spite of all the struggles that they are having with sin, of all the troubles that are happening in the church, they are loved. You are loved if you are in Christ. And this is a wonderful thing. To know that you are loved by the eternal one. To love, to be loved by the one who gives his eternal love. Because again, remember in point one, we saw that he is the eternal God. And therefore, he loves with an eternal love. That's the kind of love that he gives to us. We are loved by the Father because of Christ. No one will ever love us in this way. All the other love in the world, those who love us in the world, it ebbs and flows, isn't it? Our spouses may love us, but they will never love us perfectly. And we know that and we see that, isn't it? Our parents might love us, but they can't love us perfectly. Oh, it is only the Father in Christ who loves us with a perfect love. A love that is so strong that we are told in this verse we all know famously. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. For God so loved those who are his that he did what? He gave his only begotten son. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the amazing thing, that he is our loving and caring shepherd. This is why Christ is so precious to us. This is why Christ is so central in our life. His love remains. When we fall in sin, He still loves us. When we rise up again from our sin, which He enables us to do, He still loves us. He loves us now, and he will love us into eternity. That's an amazing and a wonderful. But he not only loves us here, he is also our shepherd. That's the other meaning of that word, little ones, or little children. Little children is this picture of vulnerability like little children believers are vulnerable we are weak
we are being assailed by enemies all around all the time. There are troubles all around. We are always being accosted by sin, the world, and the devil. But we have our shepherd with us. He is there to protect us. He is there to keep us. And therefore, we are dependent on him the way little lambs are dependent on their shepherd for protection, for care, for guidance into the pastures. That's who Christ is to us. The most precious thing to that little lamb. Imagine here is a uh, you know some sheep somewhere in a in, in a valley eating grass grass and there there are wolves and hyenas and all these dangerous animals out there. The reason why that little lamb will jump and it will enjoy the scenery and it will run around at peace is because the most precious person is there with them. Who? The shepherd. That's the same thing for us. That's why Christ is so important to us. No one else is like this to us. No one else protects us and keeps us in this way. Think about all the things that we consider precious in this life. We might say, well, the good thing with investing in this investment or in that investment or putting money here or putting your wealth there is that when troubles come, that, um, that investment will help me, isn't it? Don't we say that? That, you know, when, when, when trouble comes, I will sell that land or I will liquidate this money here and it will help me. But that only gives us protection or peace in terms of the troubles of this life and not even all the troubles of this life because there are things that money will not help us. Our education will not help us with. Our abilities, our network will not help us with. It is only Christ who is a true shepherd, the one who cares for us, the one who protects us. And therefore, our hope and our peace is in him. This is the wonderful truth. We must therefore de be dependent on him like lambs. We must be dependent and we must submit to him for protection and for sustenance. Oh, believer, please do so. See the greatness. See how precious Christ is to us. But then, since Christ is so precious to us, the application comes, which John gives at the very end. Since this is true, since Christ is the true eternal God, oh, and what a wonderful, blessed reality we have in him. Since Christ is our loving shepherd. We are like children under him. We are his darlings. No one loves us the way Christ does. So what are the implications or what is the implication? And I love this. John gives one quick but very powerful application at the end. He doesn't even give us three things, four things, five things. One thing, after all that I have written about Christ from chapter 1 and verse 1, because he began with Christ in chapter 1, verse 1, and now he ends at chapter 5. What is the application he gives? Therefore, keep yourselves from idols. Stay away. From idols. 
Guard yourself from idols. Is the last statement of the Apostle John. Now we need to ask ourselves, what does John mean when he talks about idols in this verse? So that then we may be warned. Now there are many different uh, ways that people have looked at this. One of them is that John is saying to the brethren here in Asia Minor, because Asia Minor, which is um, Turkey today, this church that he writes this letter is in modern day Turkey, although the church is no longer there. But there was a lot of idolatry then. There were a lot of idols around. And some would say then he is warning them, do not give in to the idolatry that is in your culture. And that is very true. We must watch out against the idolatry that is being brought to us from the world. Because if there is one thing we know from the world, is that the world is ever manufacturing idols. The world is ever telling you, put your hope in this. The world is ever giving you hope. Ah, here's the hope, education. Now, if you get this, your life will be okay, isn't it? And if the world sees that you don't buy this idol, they will bring another idol. Wow, 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 okay. Here is family. And if you, if you just have a nice family, and that's okay. And if you don't buy that, then they will bring you something else. Have good health. Or have financial success. Or be famous. Keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourself from what the world is constantly throwing to you that is telling you this is your source of hope. This is your source of joy. Apart from God. Anything. Anything. That takes the affection or that you give the affection and the hope that you ought to give to God is an idol. Keep away from them. That's the first way. But then the other way of looking at this word idol, and I would say that it is uh, linked with the context of this letter, is that we must remember what John has written about, what John has poured ink, so much ink to deal with. We must remember that John has been fighting from chapter 1 verse 1 to reaffirm the truth of the work and the person of Christ. The work and the person of Christ was under attack by false teachers in this church. These false teachers were modifying Christ to be in their image and in their likeness. John even talks about these people who change Christ or who distort the truth of Christ to be what? Antichrists. In other words, what these people are doing is to bring an alternative. Anti doesn't simply mean against, it can also mean alternative. What they are doing is they are bringing in an alternative Christ. A fake Christ. You know how you go to buy a radio, and uh, you want to buy a Sony, and then there is a Sweeney, I think it's called Sweeney S. It's not, if you look at it, you will think it's Sony, isn't it? It's OS, and then if you look at the O, it's not really an O. It's an O with a, it's a Q actually, and then NY. And then when you buy it, because this has happened to us in our home where we, we are, I remember when we were young, 
uh, our dad bought a certain radio, and then when we looked at it, we were like, wait a minute, this is not, this is not Sony, this is Squinny. Eh? Just change one little thing, just put a little bit of uh, just a stick there, and no one will notice it, and they will buy it thinking it's the real thing. Now, that's what false teachers are doing. They take the biblical Christ. This is what John has been fighting all along. They take the Christ of the Bible, and then they just change. They tweak something here and there about him. And what do you end up having? An idol. It is not Christ. It's an idol. That is what John is warning. Remember that idolatry, even in the Old Testament, was not limited or wasn't simply worshipping other gods like Baal, but it included worshipping Yahweh, who is not the Yahweh of the Bible. If you say I'm worshipping Yahweh, but then the way you live out, it doesn't accord with the Yahweh of the Bible. It's idolatry. Look at example. Let me just give you uh, maybe one example. Ezekiel. Ezekiel 14. Ezekiel 14. And verse 3 and 4. Look at what Ezekiel is talking about. He's, he's been talking about um, judgment on those who are in the temple. Because in chapter 10, he tells Ezekiel, look at the temple. There are people in the temple. Although they seem to be worshipping Yahweh, they are actually not worshipping Yahweh. And you see that in chapter 10, Ezekiel chapter 10, we are told about the glory of the Lord leaving temple. In other words, God, whatever is happening, the kind of worshipping that is happening in the temple in Jerusalem, outwardly, if you look at it, you will say they are worshipping Yahweh, but inside their heart, they are not worshipping Yahweh. They have an image. And this is what he says about them. Son of man, these men have taken their idols where? Into their hearts. And set a stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. And then verse 4. Therefore speak to them and say to them, thus says the Lord, anyone of the house of Israel who takes his idols into his heart. So this is what is called heart idolatry. It is a religious philosophy, a religious system which was being taught by the false teachers in this church, which makes Jesus to be in the image and in the likeness of what they want. It is a Jesus who, again, at your own time, read 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 7 and 9, and see what he talks about idolatry there. Idolatry is actually living in what? Participating in sin, a lifestyle of sin, and then you still say that we are worshipping Christ. Fat idolatry. The letter of John is full of warnings that the world and the false teachers are manufacturing a Jesus that is in their image and in their likeness and which they are peddling to the church. Now listen to this, brethren. From the letter of John, a Jesus who is not fully God and fully man is an idol. This is laid out in chapter 4 and verse 2. A Jesus who is okay with your lifestyle of sin 
is an idol. Verse chapter 3 and verse 6. A Jesus who doesn't demand for obedience to his commandment is an idol. That one you can see in chapter 2 when he talks about the commandments of Christ. A Jesus who you claim to love, but who, you al but who allows you to hate others is an idol. That is not Jesus. If Jesus is so precious to us, if he is so precious to us, dear brethren, we cannot buy this thing that is being offered. We cannot buy this thing that is being thrown to us. A Jesus who tells you, you are okay. Let's continue on in sin. Or a Jesus who is simply there to bless you with things and doesn't care about any other thing. It's an idol. That's an idol of the heart. But let me even say this from chapter 2, what John shows in chapter 2 and verse 1. That a Jesus who doesn't forgive your sins is also an idol. A Jesus whose work of propitiation is not strong enough to cleanse you from your sins is an idol. And I need to say this because... There is so much happening out there in many so-called churches where they are bringing in this idea of deliverance classes, where they tell you, you know what, Jesus saved you, but he did not deal with everything in your life, isn't it? And they tell you, you need to come for this class, and now we need to now pour some oil on you, and see, do we wash you in uh, something, and, and then you will be okay. We need to destroy some generational curse. A Jesus who doesn't cleanse you through and through is an idol. Do not buy that thing. It is a fake product. Run away from it. Keep away from it. The idols of the mind are the most dangerous of idols. They are unseen, they cannot be touched, they are also hidden behind biblical Christianity, but yet they will show themselves in how one conducts themselves in their daily life, how they love the brethren or how they do not love the brethren, how they fight off sin or how they do not fight off sin, how they love the commandments of God like David would say, oh, how I love your commandment. How they always run to the cross whenever they sin and they have the, their hope and peace at the cross. Dear brethren, let's run to this Jesus. Let's keep to this precious Jesus. What a wonderful Savior we have. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christ. Thank you for Christ, the gift of gifts, all other gifts in one. We pray, O oh Lord, that even as we have come to the end of this letter, we pray that for us, the true, truth would ring in our minds that Christ is the eternal God whom we have, that Christ is our loving shepherd, and we should therefore be at peace and not be anxious. Forgive us for our anxiety. Forgive us for the way we have not ran to our shepherd. Oh, we pray that you would cleanse us of the idols of the heart. Oh, dear Lord. Remove that Jesus from our midst who is okay with a life of sin, a lifestyle of sin. O oh Lord, spare us of that fake Jesus that 
is okay with us hating the brethren. Remove from us that idol. That obedience to your law is not required. Now that we are saved of grace, oh Lord, we pray, may we not fall for that idol. Help us to run to that which is true. We thank you and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.